Yeah, we do appreciate you giving. Last last month, uh, the month of October is what's the total is there in your bulletin this week. So it was uh, extremely generous uh, offering last last month total, and uh, that's appreciated. And help us take care of a few extra things, and uh, and actually keep the lights on, keep all the uh, electricity in order, and uh, you know. Maybe what we should do is make a, get a picture of the new panel and everything out there so they can see actually what happened. And uh, But anyway, so we just appreciate your generosity and thank you for it. God bless you. And uh, we'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 20 in your Bible this morning. And uh, this isn't necessarily a, a communion type service. I'm going to read a little bit out of 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 2 when we, when we have communion time. But I, I want to talk to you uh, from these verses in Luke chapter 20, uh, 19 through 26, but I'm not going to read it yet, but I'm going to let you get there. Luke chapter 20, in a few minutes, we're going to take a look at this and actually read it, okay? So what I'm going to do while well, you're turning there, don't mind me, I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to help us and bless us and enlighten us, and, uh, and uh, then I'm going to say a few things, and then we'll actually read the text. Lord, thank you for you, the opportunity to consider your word now uh, for our lives, for the ministry of the church, and for our lives. So we're grateful. We're thankful, Lord, you haven't left us to ourselves because all, all things, even your ministry, your life's work, even here, even what the work was on the cross, what all that was about is explained in your book. And that's how we're able to, to know for certainty of the things of life now and the hereafter. And about your love for us and your work in ministry and uh, what you have provided for us through the cross, we're grateful and we're thankful for you and for the book that you have left us. So we're able to see it, read it, hear it preached, consider it for our lives, understand it and be enlightened by it. We are grateful. We pray you help us be readers of your word, Lord. And help us not to be so concerned about how much we read at a particular time, but that we make a habit that we do and consider it for our lives. And if there's something that needs to be lived out in our lives, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us with that too and give us the grace and the courage and the determination and the help to do so. But we pray now that we'll be attentive and receptive what you have for us now from your word this day. And might it be helpful to us in our lives? in our own lives, and maybe be helpful to somebody else along the way that we have opportunity to minister to. So bless us now, Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen. And so we're going to talk about this text in Luke chapter 20. Uh, we're going to consider uh, this famous, I call it a famous saying of the Lord's that I think you will be very familiar with. It's easily understood. It's very easily understood. Okay, I think so, but uneasily administered to by us in life. It's uneasily administered by many who claim that they, they follow the Lord. And from our text, you will hear, and also now from our text, you're going to hear the word crafty, craftiness. When's the last time you used that word craftiness? You're going to hear the word craftiness. And let me tell you about that word. Craftiness in this text means deception, duplicity, hypocrisy, pretending to be, in this case, pretending to be righteous living people okay, that are asked the Lord this thing. Righteous living people that honor God. Okay under the occupation, they're trying to honor God under the occupation of the Roman Empire, the Roman armies, the Roman government in Jerusalem. So craftiness. If you looked in Matthew, and looked in Matthew, okay, you would hear the word, they tried to entangle the Lord in his words. Trip him up. Get him to contradict himself. Get him to contradict the law of Moses that they said they held to from the Old Testament. The other word you're going to hear, you're going to hear the word tribute. Okay? And sometimes in memorial type uh, events, there's somebody that will give tribute. That's not what we're talking about, okay, per se. Tribute in the text means as, as an assessment 
made on one's person, the value or worth of one's person and or property for the sake of levying a tax on somebody that they now have an obligation to pay. The other word you're going to hear also in the text, you're going to hear the word render, render. And render here for us today in the New Testament, it's not every instance that, that, that it's this outside of what we're talking about today, but rendered in New Testament and rendered in the Old Testament and even rendered in our English language. Because there's a couple different definitions for rendered for certain things, but rendered for us in all three, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, in the English, rendered means to give away. Render means to give away, give it up, give up, give it up, give over, give back, or pay back. Okay, so just remember that in your mind. And one more thing I want you to remember. The Heroidans, not a new football team, not a new basketball team, okay? But they were a political party, sort of, kind of, back in Jesus' day, the Heroidans. They were a pragmatic political uh, party or group uh, that supported and submitted it and submitted themselves to Herod Antipapus, okay, who who reigned from 4 BC to AD 39. And what they did, they submitted and 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 supported Herod for the sake of getting along with the Roman government. Uh, they were I, they were connected. I'm not so sure if they were in. I think they might have been in the Sanhedrin. They were connected to the Sanhedrin because they were they were connected to the Pharisees, sorta. Of, even though they didn't, the Pharisees and the Herodians didn't agree on certain things. There was disagreement, okay, with the Pharisees about what they were doing politically. Uh, they were compromising themselves to get along with Herod and, in essence, the Roman government, okay. Well, they were Jewish, said so they stood for Jewish identity and, and Jewish religion and, and, and Jewish culture, uh, but, they, but they were willing to do this to get along. And so uh, they had a pragmatic view about things. And the Herodians, okay, they preached compromise. And for many, including the Pharisees, considered them to be compromisers with the Roman government. And often they were at odds with the, the Pharisees and other groups, I think even the Sadducees, uh, about uh, where you stand and how you function while the Roman government with its soldiers and armies and kings and governors and all are, are in control of your country and your capital city, Jerusalem. But when it came to Christ... The Herodians and the Pharisees are in agreement that we need to do something to get rid of this guy. They were in agreement about that. They were in agreement about that. So you'll read about the Herodians in our text. Now what we're going to do, now that we had the, the big introduction and we had the drum roll, now we're going to actually read the text. And you're going to find it's very familiar, it's very famous, and you've probably heard this, this type of saying uh, somewhat frequently over the years in your life, if you spent any time in church, online, whatever, accessing whatever, you've heard this before. So Luke chapter 20, all right, Luke chapter 20, where am I at? Verse number 19, this is after the Lord told a parable about the Pharisees and about the Herodians uh, in the previous verses of chapter 20, and it's about them because they recognized that 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 the uh, that the owner's son of the vineyard comes to the husbandmen that, that are working the vineyard to get what they have produced and to reign over them. And they say, we're not going to have him reign over us. We're going to kill him and get rid of him and we'll have this vineyard for ourselves. And it says... These religious people, they, they realized Christ was talking about them in the parable, and they are really aggravated. They are absolutely beside themselves. They're super offended. They're acting really self-righteous, and they want to get back at him. That's where we're at now in our text. And the chief priest, 
and the scribes the same hour. That means right on the heels of what just happened with that parable. Okay. The same hour sought to lay hands on him, hands on the Lord, you know, get him arrested. And they feared the people for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them, the leaders, not the people, but the leaders, the Pharisees, Herodians. And they watched him and sent forth spies, which should fend or pretend themselves to be just men, holy men, holy living men, that they might take hold of his words, that so they might deliver him unto the power and the authority of the governor, the Roman governor. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest what that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither accepteth thou the person of any, but teacheth the way of God truly. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? And he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Verse 26, And they could not take hold of his words before him, before the people. And they marveled at his answer and held their peace. Now, they're not done talking with him. The Sadducees show up and give him some, uh, some weird circumstances and want an answer about the resurrection and wives, seven wives, seven husbands, whatever. But we're going to stop there. You know, this same, this same incident is recorded in Matthew chapter 22 and also in Mark chapter 12. It's in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. And when God says something three times, people should what? Listen. Should listen. Yeah, listen. And uh, what you have, you have, a, you have a, a simple saying or a simple answer with profoundly sobering, sobering and serious consequences. And it compels us to admit something that, that we live, we live, we live, if I could say it this way, under two different jurisdictions as we go through this life. Especially as a believer, we do. Okay? Uh, the kingdom of heaven, we're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We live under the jurisdiction and, and the authority of heaven uh, uh, and through the person of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and also, though, we, we, we live in a kingdom on earth, too. And we find ourselves citizens of an earthly kingdom also at the same time. At the same time. And what we have here is this. Both, both, and both are to be given what is due them. The kingdom in, of heaven is to be given what's due it, or, or God is to render to God what belongs to God, and to give also to the earthly kingdom, and, and being a good citizen, what, what is due the authorities who are in charge or in leadership. So both are be given what is due them. However, the kingdom of heaven supersedes the kingdom on earth as we acknowledge that the kingdom of on earth very often, very often, very often the kingdom on earth, very often throughout human history has demanded that we render to Caesar what rightfully belongs to God. And that's always been a clash. It's always been a problem. And it's always been the situation from time to time throughout human history. A classic illustration of this is, remember, uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he made that great golden image and set it up on, on that, uh, uh, in that, uh, that, that plateau or that uh, place there in the desert near Babylon, 90 feet high. He set that golden image up and he said, listen, all peoples and kingdoms, because he's in charge of the known world back then. You know, what they're going to do, what they need to do is when they hear all the music, they bow down and worship the golden image. And you cannot, you cannot petition anybody about anything 
for these, I think it's 30 days. When you hear the music, you bow down, worship, and if you make petition, that's when you do it. To the golden image I have set up, and that is it. That is all there is. And you know about the three Hebrew children. They said, yeah, we can't do this. They're not children or young men. We only worship and serve the one true God of heaven. And they're, they're, uh, they're administrative assistants in the government of Babylon. And so they're serving an earthly kingdom, and they're doing really well. But what you have, they have the kingdom now, and that king decide to infringe upon the, the, uh, the, rightful, the rightful place that the kingdom of God has in people's lives. You know they were thrown in a fiery furnace, but God spared their lives. And eventually, that, that wicked king, I actually believe he became an Old Testament Christian, but that's, that's for another story. But you have this very often throughout human history, listen, that, that, the, that the kingdom on earth demands that we render to Caesar what rightfully belongs to God. What rightfully belongs to God. And far too frequently, Christians, Christians, you know, it's a broad umbrella, Christians, like the Herodians in our text, in their pragmatism, concede to the kingdom of earth what rightfully should be rendered to the Lord. So they're able to retain a respectable standing among men and to continue what they think a better or good life unhindered by becoming the enemy of the state because they refuse to render to Caesar what rightfully belongs to God. They're not going to do that. They concede and they compromise to get along. So everything will be okay. But as you do that, you know, you sear your conscience. You got to come up with excuses. There are no good reasons for any of that. But they come up with excuses of why we're able to compromise and allow the government, the kingdom on earth, to infringe upon what rightfully is due the God of heaven. And Jesus said we need to be careful to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God what rightfully belongs to him. Now, I want to tell you, though, and, and I'm not trying to be obstinate and rude and antagonistic this morning, and, 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 and we're not ignorant of Romans chapter 13. We're not ignorant of Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. And we think you should be a good, a good citizen to the, to the kingdom you belong to here on earth. You, you should, as much as you possibly can. Now, a lot of the kingdoms that are on earth, they abuse, they abuse their, their place of leadership and, uh, and things like that and authority in our lives uh, because uh, a lot of times kingdoms, they want more and more control of your life. Okay? And they keep stepping on God's toes. You know who wants control of your life? Christ. God does. In fact, you were bought with a price. We're thinking about what Christ did. We were bought with a price, and so we should honor God, you know, in our soul and in our body our spirit, which belongs to him, not the earthly kingdom, not the earthly kingdom. So, so, but we do admit that Romans 13 is in the Bible. So I'm not here like being defiant and arrogant and obnoxious and rude and self-righteous, you know, about, about an earthly kingdom. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God has allowed them to be there to act as ministers for good to us, to help us live peaceably, peaceable lives. But anyway, let me, let me not get ahead. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. You'll wind up in trouble. For rulers are not a terror to good works. This is what government is for. It's not a terror to good works. And, and, and we have a government that's, that's turned on its head. And very often, it is a terror to good works. Okay? And I, I ain't got time. I need to go on. Listen. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Today, in our society, evil's called good and good's called evil. In all kinds of ways. 
Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. That's not necessarily the case anymore. For he, uh, those that are in the administrative leadership in a earthly kingdom, he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, not because you'll get in trouble if you don't obey the law, but also for conscience sake. You've got a clear conscience. For this cost, then, go ahead and pay tribute also, for they are God's ministers. You know, they, you pay, them, pay them to take care of you, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Encouraging the good, protecting the good, and, and, and putting down the evil. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. And I'll stop there. And so we, we're not ignorant of this. And we're, we're not trying to be anarchist. When we read this, listen, the fact of the matter is we, we, we agree with this because it's the word of God and we seek to live it out in our lives. But we're also not naive concerning human history and human behavior, okay, about governments. Governments are made up of, I know about all kinds of theories and all kinds of propaganda and all kinds of agendas, but governments are made, out of, made up of individuals. And we are not naive concerning human history of governments. They keep on encroaching upon and interfering with what is rightfully belongs with right, rightfully belongs to the kingdom of heaven. And when government, and when government, the kingdom on earth, when the government is insistent, okay, about this, that we render to them what rightfully belongs to God, we must answer. We must answer with respect with restraint and with resolve, and I think about the people in Daniel that had to do that, that in the matter before us, we ought to, sometimes we need to say this, what the apostle said in Acts chapter 5, that we need to obey God rather than man. Then you're in hot water. Okay. Now, however, for us today, I want you to probably figure, what are, you, what are you going to do with all this? You know, and, you know, for today, I want you to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. That's, that's, that's it. For today, for right now, think about that. And in our land, you are privileged, and you are honored, and you are duty-bound, and you are expected to vote. We used to say on election day, but election day has much more latitude now that you do that. And instead of making all kinds of excuses not to, why don't you just go ahead and do it? Just do it, vote. And believe it or not, God wants you to do it because you're to render to Caesar what's Caesar's and what's God's God's that's right you know we had a I'm not picking on anybody we had a missionary visit our churches years ago now you probably don't I don't remember that person okay and if you don't that's okay okay but uh, that nice family they were recently out of Bible college and they were going to go to France as missionaries and in private conversation, uh, he told me that he didn't believe that Christians should be involved in politics at all, and that he thought it was wrong for us to even vote, to even be involved in politics and even vote during election time, that we had no business doing that. We were doing God's business as believers. Okay? Now, I didn't make a big thing of it. I knew what school he came from. A school, uh, uh, I know the Bible college. I, I know it sort of well. 
it kind of surprised me a little bit, but that's okay because, you know, you know, Christians have some soul liberty. They can decide some things. But I thought this is really odd coming from this individual, you know. And, and he was adamant about it, that that was not the, the sphere of us as believers because we're of a different kingdom, you know. But I, I don't, and I'm not picking on him, but there it is. And I was like, you know, you forgot what the Lord said. You rendered to Caesar what Caesar's, to God what's God's. And you said, did the Lord mean voting too? Yeah, because it's in the realm of earthly kingdom. In our society, our culture, our constitution, and you know, all, we have that right to do this. We, we have this ability to have a say. And I read not too long ago, and I don't know how true it is, and I don't know how they get the numbers. And I don't know if they were trying, if, if they, here we go with they. I can't remember if this was Pew Research or not. Pew Research is a research, uh, it's not a company, and it's not really a ministry, uh, a research institute or think tank about all kinds of issues of life and relates it to church people of all kinds of varieties. But Pew Research, you got to be careful because they have leanings to the left. Okay, but they have some good stuff sometimes. And I don't, I, it might have been them, I read so much, but I read recently they said up to, they think up to 30 million evangelical Christians sort that variety will not vote this time around during the election. I said, really? Now, I was thinking about this, and they said it's a variety of reasons. You know how people are. If you have 10 people in the room, there's 11 excuses why something is whatever. You know, it's just the way it goes. You know, the people give all kinds of reasons why they're not going to vote. Christians give all kinds of reasons why they're not going to vote. And there's a lot of Christians that still believe the lies that were told to us, me too, back in the 70s and 80s, that we ought not be involved in politics and we ought, we ought to be working for the heavenly kingdom, and we ought to disassociate ourselves from the process in our country, and that was a lie. But 30 million Christians, now that doesn't mean they're all born again, but Christians under the umbrella of Christians are going to sit out this voting, uh, this election. Listen, they are individually and collectively dismissing the power they wield. That's right. It's called, you know what it's called? Influence. Can you imagine if 30 million more people of a particular persuasion voted? Can you imagine the weight of the influence of those people on who, on who gets their vote? Not just that they win an election, but that they pay attention up here. You've got 30 million people sitting over there that are of a particular desire of what they want out of their government. You understand that? Okay. And I thought about this. And, and so I know you're you and I'm me and we're little people and, you know, it's like whatever. But that I understand. But you understand collectively there's, there's this, this incredible influence. And I know about Christians, okay, uh, uh, that were not a monolithic movement and all drawing the same conclusions and all have the same standards and all the convictions. And I understand all that. But still, even if it was a couple million or five million or ten million that would be of the same influence, that's significant, don't you think? I think so. Hi, you there? Hi. You said, I hate this stuff on Sunday morning. It's okay. We'll, we'll be done with it today. Okay? It's an influence. Okay? And you would hope uh, with Christian with your name, you'd have some common sense and some biblical knowledge and vote accordingly. Amen? You would think. Amen? Influence. For some people, they just, they just say, I don't get involved in politics because... Fill in the blank. Okay. You should be involved. You know what? You, you, you get involved in many things in your life that you'd rather not be involved with, don't you? I think so. You, you can manage to at least vote. 
Get involved in rendering unto Caesar what is rightfully his. You know what God will honor you for that? He would. Uh, some people say, I don't like either one of these people, you know, that are running, you know, the primary ones, they're running for president this time and vice president. I, I don't like these people. Well, if you don't like them, you're not going to like any of the other parties either. But anyway, that's another story. But I don't like any of them. Any of this running for, for office, you need to vote anyway. And if you don't, you can't deal with people, deal with the party platform. See what they stand, see what the party stands for. I told you before, Democratic National Party, they've got 92 pages online. You can read them. They stand for everything. And they're going to do it all for you and control your life from cradle to grave. They'll guarantee you all kind of freedom, but it's under the auspices of the great God government. The Republican National Committee's got 24 pages of what they stand for, what the party is. You can read it for yourself, you know. You can have a cup of coffee and do that one, you know. You should vote. So pray, use some common sense, okay? Consider, consider your Christian values, see what they stand for, and press the voting machine button, vote. Render to Caesar what belongs to him. Uh, I'm afraid that there's going to be backlash if anyone finds out that I voted for Trump. Okay. I don't want to be bullied. I don't want to be castigated or worse. You know, so I'm just not going to bother. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. You know, just you. So, you know. I think you should fear if somebody finds out you voted for Harris. Okay. So we're to render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar to God's what belongs to God. And so I would trust that you would vote and that you would vote with a little bit of knowledge, you know, and stuff the personality thing if you need to. Okay. But with these parties, I'm, I'm almost through. If you want to come up, I'm almost through, okay, for, this, for the sermon time. Listen, one party is more about life. The other party is more about death, okay? One party is more about biology, biology, okay? The other party is more about brutal, brutal mutilations and medications, to change all that. Ch try to change your biology, which you never can. One party is more about tradition, constitution, amendments, bill of rights, see. The other party is more about turning the page so we can be unburdened by the traditions, so we can move to a, just what they, they're not saving democracy. They're destroying it. And they'd like to pack the Supreme Court and destroy that too and make it, make it ineffective, make it political. And this is not the first time that was tried and desired. Okay? Roosevelt in the 30s tried to do it too. And he had communists and socialists throughout his administration. And he was on board and admired Marx admired Stalin. One party guarantee, wants to guarantee you opportunity, the other party wants to guarantee you outcome. One will go to war with great caution and purpose and goal, the other wants war without end. Proxy wars. One is for creation of wealth, the other one is for redistribution of wealth. One is for freedom of information, speech, assembly, association, freedom of expression. The other one is for controlled, fabricated, propagandized misinformation. One party is for less government interference in people's lives, just giving them some assistance from time to time, 
the other party is is for a larger and more overreaching government that will literally control your life from cradle to grave. But into every part of your life, you will not have any privacy that you can think of. One is for sovereignty of the state with equal protection under the law. The other one is for insanity by the state without walls, without borders, with a two-tier justice system that will come into play. I can go on and on and on, and I need to stop. And you said, praise God for that. But that this morning we heard just a little bit about what Jesus, the answer Jesus gave these people when they tried to trip him up. He said, what you want to do, realize you're living for two kingdoms here while you were on planet Earth. The kingdom of men and the kingdom of God. And what I want you to do, to render to Caesar what's rightfully his, but render to God what's rightfully his. And it's not, it's not God that is the problem. It's always us. We're the problem. We always want to what? Infringe upon, step on, bully over God, and have humans pledge their allegiances and conduct their lives as government being God, which it is not. I thought there's only one God. One God. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to sing uh, before we observe communion, and then what we're going to do now that we're done with the rendering to the human government, what's rightfully its, what we're going to do then, we're, we're going to render to the Lord what is rightfully his in praise and worship in gratitude for what he has provided for us through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. That we freely are able to take of the offer of life in Christ, eternal life. It affects everything about our lives. It even affects our politics. It affects what we believe about our governments. It affects about me personally, about me trying to be a good citizen and honor, honor the earthly kingdom in which I live in, but also honor the values, what God has prescribed in his word that then pleases him, and I know that I'm approved of him. So we'll do that when we're through singing. Let's do that right now.